Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Robertson. I'm one of our joint replacement doctors here at Ortho Virginia. And today, going to be talking to everyone about anterior total hip replacements, hopefully helping to address uh, some people's understanding of arthritis and the options for treatment of it, but then specifically going into talking about the finer points of a total hip replacement as well as an anterior total hip replacement. And at the end, hopefully answer everyone's questions. So as I said, our, our goals today is obviously just to review arthritis and what goes into a joint replacement, talk about some of the treatment alternatives, even though the main point of talking today is about total hip replacements, and then obviously introduce the surgical concepts of direct anterior total hip replacement. And then obviously at the end, we'll have time to answer everyone's questions uh, regarding hip replacements or about arthritis and hip pain in general. So obviously hip replacements is one of the most common uh, performed surgeries in the orthopedic uh, field as well as generally in surgery across the world and the country. These are some very famous people that we all know, all who have gone through uh, joint replacement. Uh, as I said, arthritis is very prevalent. Uh, 91 million people are affected with arthritis. This includes all the different types. The most common one which everyone always hears about is degenerative arthritis or osteoarthritis. And that makes up over a third of those cases. Uh, so you always ask, what is arthritis? What is osteoarthritis? What is degenerative arthritis? So it's not one thing. Uh, it's not because of your parents. It's not because of playing football by itself. It's a it's a conglomerate of all the different aspects. So that involves normal anatomy, a little bit of your biology and how you were born, which does take into account genetics, but then also lifestyle, overuse, all of those aspects. Um, so obviously, joint replacement uh, joint replacements are because of a damaged joint. So a normal functioning joint should work perfectly fine, just like in this image of a hinge. A fresh, brand new hinge works perfectly fine. A healthy joint has good cartilage; it's well lubricated, has full range of motion, and most importantly, a normal joint shouldn't have any pain. If you then click to the next page, versus a arth a arthritic hip or a rusty hinge you start having damage to that cartilage, you have damage to the bone where it's grinding bone on bone. And in this case, for the hinge, you've got a rusty hinge that loses its range of motion, it squeaks, it has pain. Same thing with a, a arthritic hip, you start losing motion, you start having pain with that motion. You don't have that lubricating uh, synovial fluid that helps move it smoothly. And so you start having deficits requiring intervention. So how do you know if your hip pain is related to arthritis? So obviously there's a medical history that's taken by a health professional, usually involves some type of a physical exam, and then x-rays are our last form to sort of help confirm both the type of arthritis as well as the extent of the arthritis. So we talk about x-rays. So this is an x-ray of a hip that is a normal looking hip. If you look at it, it has well-maintained joint space, has smooth joint surfaces, nice rounded ball with a nice rounded cup, and there's no bone spurs or extra bone that's been laid down in the hip joint. If you go to the next page, you'll see a arthritic hip. So arthritic hip now has started to lose that well-rounded ball. You started to lose that joint space. It's flattening the ball. You're getting extra bone being laid down, which is the sclerotic bone that is, uh, it helps support the bone, but at the same time is a sign of the irritation and aggravation in the bone. You also start getting these cysts, which are little circles in the bone that is joint fluid actually being pushed into the bone. Um, and obviously you get bone spurs around the edge of it as your body tries to offload some of that force. So the treatment of osteoarthritis or of arthritis. So obviously it goes everything from just information up to surgery. And so there are plenty of things along the journey between activity modification, weight loss, medication, as well as offloading it with assistive devices to try to help with it. And then when all those things have failed, then there are surgical options, which we'll get into more today. So talk a little bit about it. People always ask, well, if I lose weight, will it help? It does help. So your hip sees anywhere from three to six times your body weight. And so losing weight can, can take some of that forces off of it. And then obviously there's also the aspect about weight loss and just the joint wearing out. Same thing as shocks on a car. The more weight that goes across your joint, the quicker the cartilage will wear out, the quicker you'll need to have intervention. And then the other side, which we talk to a lot of our patients, 
Obviously, weight loss can make it a safer surgery. Uh, those elevated weights do add extra stress to the surgery, both to the patient as well as to all the aspects that make it a higher risk for complication. When we talk about activity modification, the idea behind that is obviously if we can decrease the aggravation of the joint by decreasing some of our activities or modifying some of our activities, but then we'll be able to do more activities and other things without less pain uh, and keep and preserve that, that quality of life by doing other things differently. When we talk about medications, obviously the most common we talk about is anti-inflammatory. There are lots of varietals out there, both topical and oral. Obviously, sometimes these are not indicated for certain patients, so it is something you need to discuss with your primary care doctor or uh, your orthopedic doctor or other provider who's taking care of you. And sometimes it can cause other side effects that we want to avoid for certain patients. People commonly ask about the injections. Those are other medications we can use for joint uh, joint pains and arthritis, specifically in the hip as well as other joints. The most common one being a steroid injection. There also are lubricating injections, and then there also are PRP. So these are all different things that you should discuss with your provider if you're interested in. Them. The other common question about medication is supplements. So there are lots of supplements out there that are uh, that are toyed as being uh, helpful for arthritis. Uh, one common one people ask about, I was asked about just today, was glucosamine. Um, there's no strong data that it is, you know, a big effect of the cartilage and saving the cartilage, but there are some dogmatic aspects about this that do have uh, help. But in general, there's lots of other ones. The biggest thing we can tell you is they aren't proven, but if they help, we're not going to argue with those results. So surgery. So the reason most everyone tuned in today what makes a good surgical joint replacement candidate? So obviously it's somebody who's failed to have adequate relief with those conservative measures, someone who is safe for surgery, so we wanna make sure they're medically optimized, and then somebody who's informed and understands what goes into the surgery, what are the risks with the surgery, what are the benefits of it, and then obviously what are the expectations with recovery from the surgery. So our goals of surgery. So obviously it's to relieve pain. In a lot of cases, it's to improve both range of motion and mobility from the for the patient. And then the biggest goal for all of it is to get people back to their more active lifestyle, give them a fulfilling life, whereas the hip pain or in other cases, knee or other joint pain can start getting in the way of those things that people cherish and hold dear. So preparing for surgery, obviously we said you need to be evaluated by your primary care doctor, make sure that you're, you're safe if there need be. Also follow up with some specialists like cardiologists or pulmonologists, sometime an endocrine doctor to make sure you're safe for the surgery. And then a lot of times becoming educated. Sometimes that includes a preoperative joint class. Other times it's just reviewing handouts and other materials to make yourself prepared for surgery. So what is a hip replacement? So the whole purpose of a hip replacement is to resurface that disease joint area. So specifically in a hip replacement, in most cases that includes four parts. There's a shell or a cup that goes in and replaces the acetabular or the cup side of your ball and socket joint. Inside of that, usually there is a plastic lining. Then on the femoral side, we remove the ball from your ball and socket joint, as well as a little bit of bone on the femur called the femoral neck. We then insert in a metal stem that goes down into the thigh bone. And then from that, we put on a little ball on top of that, that stem that functions as our new ball for the ball and socket. So surgical steps. So obviously we have to get into the hip, we have to expose the hip. We then remove the bone that is not, not needed, specifically the femoral head. And then we prepare both the socket or the cup side of the, of the, hip, and the hip joint, as well as the femur for the implants. We then usually put in trial implants to ensure that our muscle balance is correct, that we've gotten the leg correct, as well as that we have a stable hip replacement. And then once we're happy with our trials, we then remove those trials and put in final implants and then turn to closing the hip and close up the, the surgical wound. So why the anterior approach? Uh, so what, what, what makes an anterior approach different from the others? Uh, so obviously it is an incision that goes on the front side of the leg instead of on the side or in the back. Uh, for um, the anterior approach, we work between muscles. So that's a, a lure for some people. We don't actually cut through any of the tendons or the muscles. We otherwise have certain advantages with the anterior approach that I think make it improved. Specifically, we utilize special OR tables. 
We, for certain situations, can use the x-rays to allow for precise positioning of implants. Um, obviously, uh, you know, for a lot of patients, we're looking for smaller, minimally invasive surgery. The injury approach in my hands allows me to make a smaller incision, allows me to get a, a better uh, anatomic dissection to the hip joint, gives great exposure of the acetabulum from the front side, as well as through these small incisions, through these intermuscular planes, it's less traumatic for the body. So they, they've been they've shown that we have less inflammatory aspects from it, lower uh, reaction of the muscles and the tissues to the anterior approach, as well as leave some of the structures in place in the back of the hip, which I think uh, conveys a certain degree of stability, as well as reproduction of normal anatomy with the anterior approach. Um, some of the other potential benefits, um, they have shown in the first six weeks with the anterior approach that patients have a higher post-operative satisfaction, um, higher post-operative uh, functional scores inside of that first six weeks. Long term, they have not shown that the anterior approach is significantly superior to the others, but I think that extra six weeks is worth it for the patients. Um, they've shown a faster recovery in that time, as well as for me, with the anterior approach, I am less restrictive of patient's range of motions afterwards, uh, allowing for uh, better mobility and less concerns from the patients in that recovery period. Uh, obvious with less dissection, with smaller incisions, uh, you know, there is potentially less pain with this surgery, uh, which means less pain medication, which means, uh, you know, a quicker recovery, less side effects, um, overall happier patients. Um, you know, there is some degree of potential shorter stay in the hospital. In general, I would say we have, we have streamlined our hip replacements of all sorts to where we're using multimodal medications as well as approaches and anesthesia, which allows for quicker, uh, shorter stays in the hospital. Um, but that possibly is made even better by the anterior approach. And then obviously with the lower risk of instability, with the smaller surgeries, with the quicker surgeries, there's a potential for less complications from some of our older, more traditional approaches. Um, so we talked about earlier that I like using the anterior approach because of what it conveys for me. Uh, I do think it allows for a reproducible positioning. Um, patient is laying supine. We have x-rays in the operating room in my approach that allows me to confirm that the patient is in the right position and that their pelvis is reproducible to what we've seen in the operating room. These images here are sort of in, that are examples of what the patient would look like on the table, as well as then going to that smaller view. Here is some x-rays or some images from us in the operating room of what it looks like when you're laid supine, as well as once we're draping you out. And then this next slide here sort of shows what it's like when we're all draped out. So we have an x-ray machine that can come in to take x-rays of the hip and of the pelvis to confirm. We then have the leg positioned in the special or orthopedic uh, operative table that allows us to manipulate the leg in a sterile uh, aspect, as well as to apply controlled safe traction and forces to the leg to allow for better exposure through smaller incisions, uh, as well as, as I said, reproducibly do the surgery, which makes it that we can provide a more reliable surgery um, time in time. Um, so obviously, as we said, uh, x-ray does also bring the advantage of confirming both cup positioning as well as confirming our leg length, especially in big deformities or in dysplastic anatomy. Um, and so then I can more repro more reliably reproduce the anatomy. And we can even do it to where, correct to the next slide, we take x-rays of the operative side as well as the non-operative side, and we can actually flip them and overlay them both on traditional old school technology, click to the next slide, as well as with modern uh, digital technology that we confirm that we've recreated the anatomy uh, back to what would be the normal anatomy on the other side. Next slide. And then obviously, as we're doing the surgery, if I have x ray right there, I can confirm that my component is exactly where I want. And so in this case right here, we're putting the cup into the pelvis. And I can confirm that my my an angle is exactly where I want it. And so in this case, we decided we wanted a little bit more of the angle and the version. So we then immediately adjust it. And you can see as as we wait, we can we can dial in specifically where we want our components based on the X-ray anatomy 
uh, which allows for my hands a better outcome in the end. So what to expect from a, from an anterior approach turtle hip? So you're out. out of surgery the same day of surgery. As we said, with our rapid pro protocols, you can even go home the same day. You have immediate full weight bearing, no, no range of motion restrictions. Uh, therapy obviously starts progressing immediately after surgery uh, with some degree of therapy, whether it's self-directed, it's, it's uh, hand, hand out supervised or whether it's directly supervised by a physical therapist, progressing you rapidly over the next few days to weeks. Um, and then obviously transitioning away from assisted devices as you tolerate. Usually people are up with forearm crutches or a walker the day of surgery. But I have some patients who even as soon as they go home are no longer using the assisted devices. But most are usually away from their assisted device by one to two weeks after surgery. Um, obviously right after surgery, if you have a dressing in place, we usually apply a waterproof dressing. So it allows you to shower immediately after surgery. You're usually closed with sutures that are absorbable that are under the skin. And then we usually have some degree of suture uh, adhesive glue over top of the skin to help hold the skin closed until the, the skin heals. Uh, and obviously, as I mentioned earlier, you know, with our modern, modern protocols, we have a multimodal recovery protocol. So it involves both anesthesia as well as uh, perioperative injections, as well as efficient, precise surgery to minimize the overall anesthesia you get as well as uh, you know, early intervention from the therapist in the hospital that gets you up to So the common question we get is, well, what happens to my joint replacement? How long will this last me? People used to get told that their joint replacement was good for five to 10 years. That data obviously has been ellipsed. And now we're looking at 20, 25 year outcomes from these hip replacements. That's mainly from the plastic wearing. Once the bone grows into the implant, they're relatively stable. But after 20 to 25 years, that doesn't mean just all of a sudden falls apart. It is a wearing out. And so that doesn't mean that at 20, 25 years, you will have to have a revision. It just means that some will start happening to. And that, that revision rate is somewhere between a half or 1% per year. So that means at 10 years, there are some that do have to be revised. It's usually somewhere 5 to 10%. And then at 20 years, still means it's only you know, 80 to 85% uh, revision rate with you know, good survivorship. Um, so these these implants can last you the rest of your life, or at least last a large portion of your life. So overall, um, you know, would have you take away that the total hip is a successful surgery, specifically the anterior total uh, hip is a very successful surgery, has excellent long-term results. Patients are overall very happy that they had the surgery. And then I think the direct anterior approach is a good option in the options of total hip replacements. Otherwise, um, I know that uh, some people are, are submitting in questions. But at this time, we'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible. And so please submit your questions um, on your screen and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Thank you so much, Dr. Robertson. There are indeed questions coming in. So one of our questions is, is the procedure covered by insurance? Yep. So obviously there is a authorization process that goes through, um, but in general, most insurance uh, plans do cover this surgery. As I said, it is one of the most common surgeries performed in the United States as well as worldwide. Um, so most all insurance companies do cover it. Sometimes there is additional documentation or uh, even uh, doctor to doctor conversations to get it approved, but no, it is, it is approved by most all insurances. Thank you. What makes someone eligible to have an interior approach for their hip replacement? Um, so obviously there are certain aspects about anatomy as well as, um, you know, previous incisions, previous surgeries that sometimes prohibit the anterior approach. But in my own practice, I would say 98% of patients can have an anterior approach total hip. Uh, but there are certain things, whether it's because of previous surgery or anatomy that would preclude certain patients, but the majority of patients in my hands can have an anterior approach total hip. Thank you. Is a patient who has bone on bone in their hip eligible? Yeah. So obviously the bone on bone is a is a radiographic finding. It is a a component of people's arthritis that leads to them having to uh, undergo surgery because of the pain that they're sustaining from it. Uh, but it is not something that would preclude you from getting it. If anything, uh, there are people who are far past bone on bone. Uh, and also those who have less than bone on bone who still are surgical candidates for an anterior approach. Thank you. For younger patients in their 50s 
who have been runners before the surgery, are they able to resume running after recovery or is that too much stress for the implant? Yeah, so it's, it's not too much stress for the implant. Um, so there was old dogma in joint replacement that said you couldn't run after a hip replacement or a knee replacement. That has kind of gone by the wayside. Our implants are good enough. They, once they grow into the bone, can support that stress. Unfortunately, there is there is some degree of patients who still, despite the implants being good enough, just can't tolerate the impact of running. And so they have to start looking for other cardiovascular exercises to, to step in and to fill that void from them. Uh, I do think that the ANTA approach can be a, a good option for those patients who are high functioning and active as you know, require to cut through any of the muscles, has a little bit of a quicker recovery, gets people back to running sooner. Um, but I usually still, with all that being said, do caution my patients in the first three months to allow for that bone to grow into the uh, implant so we make sure it's nice and stable before we start loading and stressing it. Like. Thank you. What is the expected time until a patient is released to full activity after their surgery? Yeah. So as I said, we the whole point of, of this surgery is to get people back to being active and to have the enjoyment they want in their life. So it is a graduated return to activity. Um, so as I said, they're full weight bearing the first day, quickly getting away from their assistive devices they tolerated. Otherwise, then starting to gradually advance some of their light activities, getting back to the gym, getting back to exercise with being on a bike, walking, um, but avoiding some of the more strenuous exercise for that first three month period. So I usually caution people from heavy lifting, I caution people from explosive running and high impact things that may inhibit that bone from going into it, as well as the high rotational or twisting exercises activities. That means sometimes we hold off on return to golf or explosive activities for that first three months, doing more of the chipping, more of the putting, more of the, the small rotation, so as to allow for that bone to aid. Thank you. Is it normal for the operated on leg to be longer after surgery? Uh, so part of my goal with the surgery is to avoid making the leg longer. There are certain clinical situations or, or reasons why a person may end up with a longer leg after the surgery, whether it's because of a anatomy issue, whether it's a soft tissue tensioning issue, because obviously we want to make a stable hip that reproduces the normal anatomy. There are times that because of soft tissue aspect that we may have to add extra tension to the hip to hold the hip reduced. Um, but no, in general, that's part of the benefit of the anterior approach. I think in my, in my hands is I can radiographically take x-rays to make sure that I, I am recreating the anatomy as close to possible as, as is safe for the patient. Thank you. If someone is scheduled for a hip replacement in the near future, how do they know if they're going to have an interior approach? So obviously it would be something you would have wanted to have touched base with on your doctor. So some doctors use it, some, they, some doctors do not. Um, there's no aspect that it makes or requires people to use one approach or the other for, for surgery. And so there are some people who've been trained in the interior approach and there's others who've been trained in the posterior approach. And as I said, both can have very good long-term outcomes and data. Um, but there's some of us doctors who do use the entry approach, so then something to discuss with your doctor before scheduling surgery. Thank you. If someone has an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, are they able to get the surgery? Yeah, so obviously, as I said, you know, you know there's a large portion of patients in the, country, in the world in the country who have other types of arthritis aside from osteoarthritis, and so lupus and rheumatoid arthritis are other types that we have to address and treat with, with surgery with joint replacements. Obviously, I think the anterior approach is a great option for those patients because some of those patients will have a little bit more soft tissue laxity or inflammation of the tissues. And so I think it conveys a certain degree of stability and support for it. Um, and there are certain times when I'll have patients referred to me by other surgeons who do other approaches who, if they're worried about instability or worrying about positioning, whether it's because of a, a rheumatoid or a lupus or an inflammatory arthropathy or because of previous surgeries or spinal deformities or surgeries that we, we believe that the anterior approach can convey a little bit extra stability to the hip. Thank you. How soon can a patient go back to work after surgery? Yeah, so that is, that is obviously, you know, each patient uh, specific. 
So if you are mainly a sedentary desk job uh, profession, you can get back to that as soon as even inside of a week or two. Obviously, most people are required to be off narcotics to get back to work. So that can be a limiting factor. From a functional standpoint, you may still need an assistive device, but you can always go and be sedentary. It's the people who are manual laborers that is a little bit more of a, a you know, a toss up about how quickly they can get back. Some people can get back to a manual labor job six to eight weeks. Others, they need to be out for three months. It just depends on how manual labor, how quickly their recovery is. And usually we err on caution, so plan for being out longer, and then always be, be satisfied and happy when you're able to return sooner than expected. Thank you. How soon can someone fly after their surgery? So there's no there's no limitations on flying. It's obviously somewhat of a understanding of the risks. There's also an understanding of the pain and symptoms you may have to endure to do that. Uh, I have taken care of people who've flown uh, the day after surgery for if they've flown in for surgery. I've also taken care of people who have have chosen not to then fly and then choose to travel by by uh, car. But the issue is is you're starting to have trade offs. So prolonged uh, trip in a car. Um, can be more stiffness, more soreness versus a shorter flight. Um, obviously both, I encourage people to get up and walk during them. So if it's driving, stopping, getting out, walking every you know couple hours. If it's a plane, once you're airborne, get up, get out of your chair, walk so you don't get too stiff, but also will minimize your risk of blood clots, but then usually will keep people on blood thinners um, during that flight to minimize that risk of blood clots. Thank you. How much time is needed between two hip replacements and opposite legs? So obviously there are different uh, physicians out there with different approaches to this. So obviously each surgeon is going to tell you their own approach. Um, obviously there are some patients who are candidates and are appropriate for having both hip replacements done at the same time. There's some benefits and drawbacks of that that you'd have to talk with your doctor about. Um, otherwise, um, you know, some doctors will do it as early as one to two weeks separated. I, in my own practice, will usually try to stagger the hip replacement six weeks. My belief behind that is for those patients who I don't think would be a good candidate for both at the same time, uh, it then allows for uh, you to re-up your blood store so you get your hemoglobin back up so it's less likely that you'll need a blood transfusion. It also allows you to get over the first one to a degree before we subject you to the second one so that you quote unquote have a good leg to stand up. Thank you. If someone is 48, is there an argument for putting surgery off as long as possible or should they go ahead and get it done? So obviously that is a patient specific answer as well. Uh, unfortunately, I've had to replace people's hips as young as 29. Um, but obviously it is a it is a prosthesis. It is a artificial joint. And so they do have wear, they do wear out over time. And so even if we think that they have great outcomes of 20 to 25 years, possibly longer, in 48, you're probably looking at a revision at some point in your life. But then it's a trade-off of how painful are you and how much of an impact on your quality of life will that have if you delay. And then it is a way in the risks and benefits of electing move forward with the surgery at 48 and getting back however many of those years you would be losing from a functional, a enjoyment, children growing up, activities you'd like to be doing that otherwise you'd be able to do if you went ahead with the surgery and, you know, weighing that against, you know, possibly having to have a revision surgery sometime earlier in your, in your elder years. Thank you. If you have osteoporosis, is there a risk of the bone shattering or breaking during the surgery? So, uh, unfortunately, that is always a risk irrelevant of osteoporosis. Obviously, all of us do uh, techniques to try to minimize that risk uh, of a what we call an intraoperative or periprosthetic fracture. Obviously, the weaker your bone is, the higher that risk is. And so, actually, for some of my older patients or my severe osteoporotic patients, uh, we will use a different type of hip implant. Uh, one that does not get wedged into the bone as much and that instead is glued into the bone with a special bone cement. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Robertson. And thank you, everybody who submitted questions. Any questions that we did not have a chance to answer, we will answer in the comments. Dr. Robertson, would you like to close? Otherwise, thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, we greatly appreciate it. And we hope this was informative.
informative for you. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, joint replacement is a big part of a lot of people's lives. And so uh, I hope this answered for answered questions for those of you out there. And then obviously, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us uh, either through the comments or uh, schedule an appointment to come in to see us at Ortho Virginia and we can help further answer any of your questions. Have a good rest of your day.